today we are doing a special masterclass on going beyond features and benefits. I just want to say that uh, if you are joining, hello, uh, I'm very happy to have you. And I'm very much looking forward to talking with you all today. I hope that this is helpful. This particular masterclass was selected by you. And once a month or every two weeks, I'm going to try to put up for a vote what masterclass you guys want to see. And then I'm going to basically go along with whatever you want to see. And if you want a say in which free masterclasses we make for the channel, all you have to do is join our free Discord, link in the description below, and sign up and participate. It, it really is that simple. Here's how this is going to go. We are eventually going to be talking about what lies beyond features and benefits. Every single copywriter worth their salt knows that they need to be able to articulate and write about the features of a product and the benefits of a product. But we want to go a little bit deeper than that. We want to get into like the real nitty gritty of like what it is that spurs people to buy, what it is that really entices them and allures them. The subconscious promise there is how to tap into your prospect's deepest desires. From Square zero, I am going to sit down with the spreadsheet and we are together going to actually do a little bit of features and benefits research. I don't know what product is going to be about. You guys are going to choose and then we're going to go and we are actually going to sit down and take some notes on what features and benefits are and how we can go a little bit deeper than both of those. But before we get into all that, we need to actually discuss some theory, like why this even matters, what features and benefits even are, why they appeal to people. And basically, we need to understand a little bit the psychology of desire or why people buy shit. Here's the biggest myth about copywriting. You probably think, or at least have thought, that your job is to sell products or to cultivate engagement. That is such a myth. And what I want you to do right now is look at this list. These are the reasons why people buy or engage with things. These are all the reasons. If you want to sell them a thing, you argue why they're going to get these results. I want to ask you, what's not on that list? Buying things to buy things. If you, as a copywriter, believe that your job is to sell products, that's not on the list. So your job, in truth, is to sell people ideas, not products, because people buy ideas and not products. And usually, not always, that idea that people have is a desired self. What you're trying to sell people is a desired self, not, for example, a ballpoint pen that, you know, is laden with you know, mother of pearl and gold and silver, but rather the type of person who has a pen that that's valuable. You know, a person who drives a Lexus, you know, there's a desired self there, a yearning to be the type of person who drives a luxury car. So if you show people that desired self and then give them a pathway to get there, they are going to adore you. And that's true whether you are writing car commercials. It's true whether you are writing Facebook ad copy. It's true regardless of the kind of copy you write. You are trying to paint a picture of a desired self and then show the pathway to get there. Usually that pathway involves buying the product. All that said, here's the upshot. The bulk of your work as a copywriter is understanding who your ideal buyers are, who their desired self is, what ideas and appeals will entice them the most, and what pathway you can provide to get them to what they want, not actually writing the copy itself. You often see, hey, copywriting is 80% research, 20% writing. This is what I'm actually talking about. It's understanding those desires, those notions, those identifications, and one other thing I'll mention a little later, and finding out how to structure your words in a way that appeal directly to the people with those desires, notions, and identifications about the world. All of this is sort of dancing around something that we go over in the five-hour course, The Fundamentals of Writing to Sell. Alex did a very wonderful two hours in that five-hour course just on research, like finding out like what people desire, what people's notions are, et cetera, et cetera. This particular masterclass is not going to be about that, the actual praxis. We will go over that a little bit at the end, but this is going to be more about the psychology of desire and the articulation of words and benefits in such a way as to be appealing to different audiences. And so if you want a good foundation of all this stuff and also some practical methods of actually doing this stuff, go watch that five hour video, take a lot of notes, especially on the research process. I, I threw a testimonial in there because it has a lot of good testimonials. It comes highly recommended by four out of five members of Copy That. 
so that's what I want you to do. If if you want like actual like, okay, how do I do this kind of research? How do I find people's desires, for example? Go watch this video. But in the meantime, let's go a little bit deeper and back up. What are desires? These are things that people yearn for or yearn to be rid of. This is what you want, like in the squiggly bits of your balls. This is what you kind of crave. Your notions are your beliefs about the world. These are the things that you sort of like have in your head as being sort of true. Like you just kind of know that they're true. Identifications are what people align with and associate with. Like for example, if you are selling to Southern conservative Americans, you probably want to lean into the fact that they identify as patriotic American. Now, the fourth thing that can help inform your copy a little bit are their actual physical characteristics. Now, this is sort of tied to their identifications, but like a lot of people have characteristics that they choose or delude themselves into not identifying with. And these are just like what they're physically or mentally like. So like, for example, there is a proliferation of people out there who are very obese and who do not see themselves as, uh, as obese. And so if you were trying to appeal to them as having a cure for their obesity, they're not going to respond to your ads because that's a characteristic and not an identification. These things you have to kind of think about. A lot of this stuff is invisible to people. A lot of people desire things and do not know why they desire them. You know, a lot of people believe things about the world, but don't they, they consider them to just be universally true and not an actual belief. One thing you got to understand as you're doing research about this stuff is that they're not going to talk about it. They're not going to question this stuff. You know, they want money because they want money. When in reality, you know, if you sort of dig a little bit and ask them enough questions that don't turn them off, but actually get a little bit revelatory. What they actually want is freedom. You know, they want to spend more time with their kids. They, you know, they want, you know, more relaxation. They want more leisure. Uh, they want the respect of their friends, uh, the envy of their enemies, things like that. Money is just a bridge to all those things, but they don't know that, you know, not foregrounded brain know that. And so your job as a copywriter and a marketer is to detect, discover, and infer that information from surveys, research out there, conversations you have with people. Nobody is going to give you this information. You have to find it or kind of piece it together yourself. That's your job. No client is ever going to give you a brief that tells you what people believe who have bought their products before. If you do, that's a cushy job and you should do your best to like make sure to keep it. Now, we have to kind of go over why this is important. You can't know what features and benefits in a product or service will appeal to people until you understand whom you're writing to and what they actually want. I'm gonna give you a specific example of this. There are two audiences out there that a single product was marketed to that I, I think is really exemplary of like how to connect, you know, different features and benefits to different desires. There are two demographics, MMA fighters, video gamers. One of them desires a strong neck, the other desires less pain and better posture. One has beliefs about the world that a strong neck will help them avoid concussions. The other has the notion that their habits are harming their body and they need to do corrective things to fix it. There are not a whole lot of products that would appeal to both of these demographics, but there is one that is actively being marketed right now and sold very well right now to both of these demos. The Iron Neck, the best product of all time. It is literally a halo that you put around your neck it allows you to spin and it provides resistance three in 360 degrees around your neck. So it gets your, your you know, sternocleidomastoid, your levators, your scalenes, your erector spinae. It allows you to exercise the whole circumference of your neck. That is indeed Joe Rogan, yes. If you were trying to sell an iron neck to an MMA fighter, well, you would probably show ads along the lines of social proof and you know, make sort of like engagement pieces that talk about injury prevention and exercise. Obviously, these things would appeal more to somebody who's more on the athlete side than another. That is going to be one way to appeal to those people. Both of these have implied benefits. Training neck is the most important exercise for injury prevention. The implied benefit being, oh, I just need the pathway, the thing that helps me train my neck in order to prevent injury. Do you understand what I'm saying about providing people with a pathway to a desired self, a self without pain? How do you sell an iron neck to a gamer though? Well, you have a SEO piece, how to get rid of tech neck. This Facebook ad right here, that was all about alleviating pain and looking better. You can reach out to social media influencers and like provide copy for them and talk about how this weird flying head saucer can actually help you with gaming neck pain. 
you're appealing to the specific desires of the demographic. It's the same product, but you're able to sell to different demographics by appealing to different desires, notions, and identifications that they have about the world. And so everything that I'm talking about is sort of dancing around a concept that you've probably heard about before, but probably don't know anything about, which is called positioning. All positioning is, is what details and what characteristics of something that you want to foreground and use to get the attention of your potential customers and what you want to reveal along the way to entice them to buy. If you were trying to talk to the video gamers, you probably don't want to open up with a discussion from a very burly MMA fighter who's talking about how, well, now when he gets smacked in the face, he can take it a little bit better. That's not going to appeal to a video gamer. You have to sort of position the details and the outcomes of this particular product a little bit differently. Obviously, one of the things that you can show is a demonstration. Somebody like sitting at their desk kind of like this and then showing an after picture of them like this. And obviously you would want to change the lighting a little bit so that one looks a little bit more ugly and the other looks a little bit more attractive. And all of a sudden you have an ad that had details positioned a little bit differently and had details that were, you know, might've been omitted in one ad brought to the fore in another. That's the point. Now we are finally at the point where we can talk about features and benefits because features and benefits and which ones to reveal, how to articulate them, it all comes down first and foremost to understanding what people yearn for and desire, what people believe about the world world, their notions, and how people identify. For example, features, and I'm just going to give you some definitions here so that we're all on the same page. Your features are just characteristics, specifications, yada, yada, yada. This is a 72 inch television screen. The 72 inches is a feature. You're going to go over and look at technical aspects, physical traits, details about the service. Like for example, do you get 24 seven customer service when you buy a product or buy a service? If yes, that would count as a feature. Features are just factual statements about what the product is and what it does. A lot of newbie copywriters really sort of get lost in the sauce on features. Like they really, they really only just sort of spell out what features are because they think that that's their job. But again, I remind you, we are not selling products here. We're selling ideas. Here's the thing, that idea, that desired self, you want to show that a product can actually get people to that desired self. You want to show that they're going to get the outcomes that they yearn for, that they crave, that they will get to be able to sit on a Lamborghini next to several supermodels, as I have. The benefits that you want to actually talk about are the positive outcomes that a customer will experience by using the product or service. You want to focus on the value and the impact of the features that they're going to have on a user's life. I don't have a slide for this, but I want to sort of spell out the difference between direct benefits and implied benefits. When I showed you earlier, like what my successes were from like understanding this stuff and yada, 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 that was an implied benefit. I was not saying, hey, you will get this result. Hey, you will get $10,000 a month if you just do this. Hey, here's how to get a client, you know, in 30 days stuff like that. I'm not going to do that. A direct benefit would be more like buy this product and you will get this benefit. Easy clients, clients that, you know, are calling you instead of you calling them, things like that. It's the outcomes that you are basically just telling people that they're going to get as opposed to showing people stuff and letting people make the conclusion themselves. That would be an implied benefit. Let's just go back to the iron neck. If you look at the ads for the iron neck, you can very clearly see that they're spelling out features. But I want you to pay attention to this because they're not just spelling out, you know, it's, you know, 14 inches in diameter. It has like 13 different like resistance measurement, yada, yada, yada. That's not what people want from an iron neck, especially in terms of the features. So look at this air fit bladder. All this stuff is made proprietary. So it actually seems more like a system more, you know, interesting than what it actually is. The rear pad forms to the back of the head, uh, back of the user's head for a secure fit. What is the implication of that copy there? What is the subtext? So this pad, because of the air fit bladder, that feature will actually conform to the back of your head. The implication is that there's comfort there. There's implied benefits to these features. Also, it's secure, so it's not going to fall off. And if it's not going to fall off, that means it's more certain it's more safe. Look at this air fit bulb pumps air into the rear pad for a custom fit every time. That means that it's probably going to be able to adapt to your enormous misshapen head. That's just a feature of this. 
three interchangeable front pads, small, medium, large. Again, more about interchangeability, more about accessibility. The implication of these features is that you're going to be able to adjust it to whatever you need to be. Now let's talk about the benefits of the R neck. Look at this. This is just straight from one of their ads. It's great for fixing neck pain, improving posture, increasing mobility, eliminating stiffness. These are all benefits, things that people desire. Obviously, if you were talking to one demographic as opposed to another, you're going to talk about different benefits, different outcomes, because different demographics desire different outcomes. They all yearn for different things, and they all want a different pathway there. A video gamer who just wants their pain to stop is going to have a different desired self than an athlete who wants to win a competition. Your ads need to spell that out. Here's another example. Let's say you have a, you're selling an extra long-lasting cell phone battery. If you look at the features of it, you can talk about the small size, you know, like you can actually spell out the dimensions and talk about how it has the universal adapter. You can talk about how it lasts 24 hours. If you're sitting down and you're taking a list of these features, you're looking at the product and you're listing out the features, what I want you to do as a copywriter is start building a bridge. Look at the small size of something and go, okay, well, what's the benefit of that? Well, the benefit of that is, is probably pretty convenient, probably easy to carry. If you look at the feature of a universal adapter, you go, okay, well, what's the benefit of that? Well, it allows you freedom. It allows you to work from any phone you have. It allows you to work anywhere in the world. Great. Last 24 hours, there's the benefit. No need to carry a charger. All I did here was go feature by feature and think to myself, well, what is the outcome a person would want from this? How does this benefit the user? Now, if I were to write ad copy for it, would I have to include all these details? No. I would try to pay attention to the desires, notions, and identifications that people have, and then I would foreground whatever I thought was going to be most appealing or enticing to people. So like, for example, if I were talking about oh, somebody who just needs an extra long-lasting charger because they're going to work in an office, probably worth mentioning the convenience aspect more than the fact that you can work from anywhere in the world. You see what I'm getting at? What features could you offer for an online course? The number of modules that it has, the length of the videos, the number of worksheets, how many instructors there are, what people are actually going to learn from them. Is it downloadable? So you would go, you would write down in your little feature column, downloadable videos. And the benefit of that is that you can watch this stuff offline. That's how you play this game. Let's go a little bit deeper because this is all sell me this pen bullshit. This is all stuff that if you have watched The Wolf of Wall Street or any fucking introductory course on YouTube about copywriting, you understand probably pretty intuitively what features and benefits are and how to come up with them. If you don't, then welcome to the fold. I'm sorry for cursing so much. There are actually four levels to this. I don't think I've ever actually seen another copywriting guru really talk about this because I learned this from Mark Ford, who got this from several other copywriters. And I don't think that anybody's ever actually published something recently about this. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a Shawnee Mac special. Really, what we're talking about when we're talking about all these different levels is features, advantages, benefits, and deeper benefits. This is where things get a little bit deeper. You know, you can, you can have a solid career. You can make money just understanding features and benefits. If you want to make real money, it probably is worth knowing what I'm talking about here. A lot of people pick up on this stuff kind of intuitively without having given it a name. So what are features? It just describes what a product is or does. There you go. Advantages describe what a product does better than other products. And this can help you sort of tap into people's identifications or notions. Like for example, if you are selling a product that is made for women, you can talk about, well, if somebody identifies as a woman, you can talk about how this product is going to be better for them as a result. Benefits are simply a product's ability to give people what they desire. Deeper benefits are where we get into a little bit murkier territory. People often do not know what they truly desire. A person who is an MMA fighter who wants a stronger neck so they don't get a concussion probably wants that stronger neck, probably doesn't want to get a concussion because they want to win a fight. Why? Well, because they have this insatiable urge to compete. Why? Well, because they probably always felt weak when they were a child and, you know, had a very overbearing father who probably was a little abusive and they never want to feel weak again. Oh, shit. <laughs> Did we just do a psychology? That's what we're getting at when we're talking about deeper benefits. We're really trying to get at the heart of like, 
understanding why people want a thing, why people want an outcome. The whole point of deeper benefits is to connect a product to what's truly behind a person's desire. And this often has to do with their notions of ident identifications, but not always. So I want to actually talk about a few different examples, but very simply, the reason why you want to learn this stuff and why you want to start thinking about deeper benefits is that it makes your copy more understandable, more interesting, more impactful, and more compelling. This is actually something that David Deutsch taught me. It allows you to truly paint a picture of a desired self. This is what's going to take your copy from good to great. Not every piece of copy needs you to go deep into like the advantages of this product over another product. It doesn't need you to like psychologize and like talk about a person's like mommy issues in the copy or talk about like how they always wanted to see France because, you know, they saw Ratatouille as a kid and they just can't shake the notion, this magic that they have in their head about Paris. No, like you don't need to spell out the deeper benefits of everything. Sometimes features are enough. Sometimes features and benefits are enough for real. Like for example, PCs, most of the time when you're selling a personal computer, you often don't really need anything beyond features because everybody wakes up in the morning being like, ah, oh, crap, I need a better PC. So you tell people the features that show people this PC that I'm selling is better than what you have. And then people buy and it's really easy. Most e-com copy is like this. That's why most e-com copy is bad. And it gives a huge opportunity for you to come in with just like, oh, a, a few advantages, a few benefits sprinkled in here with the features and bingo, bango, all of a sudden you have winning copy. But here's the thing. A lot of e-com products, like for example, um, oh God, I don't know, uh, novelty pet scratchers. You know, what's the deeper benefit there? You know, the benefit is going to be that, you know, like, hey, your dog will get a very good scratch. What's the deeper benefit? Oh, well, you're going to, you know, treat your dog better than you were treated when you were a child. Oh, oh my God, <laughs> we're psychologizing again. You don't need to spell all that out in the copy to make a sale. And part of mastering this is understanding like, okay, when do I need to go deeper? The answer to that usually is dependent upon whether you are trying to sell against alternatives that mainly rely on features and benefits, and you want to try to sell a different angle or position things a little bit differently. Another reason why you would want to go deeper is because you're trying to sell an idea that's a little less in demand. How do I mean by that? Like, for example, if you're trying to sell a financial newsletter, here's the feature. It has 24 pages and it's written with ink. It has a section about stock investing and a section about real estate investing. Who cares? Like, nobody cares about a financial newsletter. Okay, what are the advantages? It has a better track record than others. Okay, now we're talking. Now we're talking about something that can actually sell. What is the benefit? It's proven that people who follow this particular newsletter have gotten richer. Oh my God. Well, now we're talking, not talking about a desire for a financial newsletter. Now we're talking about a different desire, a different yearning to get richer. But why do people want to get richer? Now we start psychologizing again. We start asking why? Well, if I have more money, I'll be able to buy more stuff. Why do you want more stuff? Well, there's a big gaping hole left in my heart as a result of being raised poor. Oh shit. Now we're on to something. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what we're doing here. We're trying to think about like how we can bring like from surface level details down into the deep, deep yearnings that people have. If you want to set something apart, coaching services are a dime a dozen anyway, so that could be useful. Or when there's like not a whole lot of nascent demand there. So coaching and high ticket services, definitely, that definitely applies. What would be the features of a coaching service? Okay, once a week, you get a call on Zoom. It will be exactly 67 minutes long. What are the advantages? Well, 67 minutes long is longer than other coaches who sell 60 minute coaching sessions. Okay, kind of weak, but that is an advantage, I guess. Benefits. Well, the benefit to this particular coach, if you can prove it, is that learning these particular tips, tricks, tools, etc., that this coach has, you will be able to have more guidance towards a particular goal. Say it's, um, you know, healing from a past trauma. Well, why do you want to heal from a past trauma? Oh, well, it's because my inability to connect with other people has been a detriment to my work and relationships, and I would like to have an advantage in life, or at least be a little bit better off than other people who can't recover from those traumas. Hey, that's a deeper benefit.
there you go. And so ultimately what you're trying to get at is with benefits and deeper benefits is the outcome, but also the outcome that they truly want, but their forebrain has not articulated yet. Again, that's what takes copy from good to great. Now, I want to give a, an example, and I love this example from Dan Kennedy. He was talking about what research do you need to do? And almost all the research that you need to do is more about the prospect and the market than about the actual product itself. And he said, if you could get away with it, you wouldn't even ask the client for any details about the product. You do that to make the client feel better, but it's not actually super useful to you because what's useful to you is finding out people's desires, notions, and identifications about the world. Here's a very specific example that he got from a hearing aid company that he was trying to sell. Now, the company gave him all the technical specifications, talked about the, you know, the frequency, the size, the fit, the stuff like that. And he was looking at this and he was like, none of that is what people care about. Again, the features are not why people buy a hearing aid. People buy a hearing aid for the outcome. So they need to know the benefit. And so what, what was what was this company originally advertising? Like, what were they selling in their original ads, the ability to take a walk and hear the birds again. Dan Kennedy said, people don't fucking want to hear so they could go bird watching. That's ridiculous. That's silly. Nobody wants that. He started actually interviewing and talking to people who were getting a little older and people that were losing their hearing. And the easy way for him to do this was to actually just reach out to past customers of this business. And what he discovered was that in reality, people were afraid of losing their hearing because the people that lose their hearing exhibit behaviors that are almost indistinguishable from dementia. People wanted a hearing aid because they felt alienated, isolated. Have you ever been around an old person who just like blurts out random stuff and you're like, where did that come from? Chances are it's because they misheard what was said before. What he found from talking to people was what they really feared was getting put into a home. They didn't want to be put into an assisted living facility. They didn't want to be taken away from their friends, their home, their loved ones. They didn't want to be sent away to where we, you know, make old people disappear. God damn, that is a deeper benefit. Here's another thing. When parents have kids, oftentimes grandma is the number one babysitter for a lot of families. But here's the thing. They found statistically that if grandma can't hear, can't take care of the kids well, parents are less likely to leave their children with grandma or grandpa. People in general want to feel trustworthy. They want to feel like they can be relied upon. They want to feel valuable and valued. What happens if all of a sudden you have somebody you love saying, mm, I don't trust you with my kids. Oh, oh, ow. God damn. Deeper benefit. You can't just come out and say, like, initially, get this hearing aid and you'll be able to, like, take care of your kids. You have to, like, smoothly incorporate these details. You have to segue in. You can't just come out with deeper benefits. And then the next example, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Listen, I don't normally do this, but trigger warning. There's a trigger warning for the next example. But one of the things that Dan Kennedy talked about was that, like, once you have somebody's attention, then you can use deeper benefits to really, really, really tap into people's yearning. Yearning that people often didn't even realize they had. Guess what? Dan Kennedy did not get that from studying other ads. He did not get it from studying other hearing aids. He did not get it from competitor research. He did not get it from looking at the product. He got it from talking to people and understanding them. That is what you want to do as a copywriter when you're selling a product that, you know, you're going to get paid a lot of money for. If you're getting paid 10 bucks for an Upwork, like an Upwork gig, then, you know, don't worry about it so much. But like, if you want to go deeper, these are the things that you have to do and the things that you have to actually talk about. I've already given a trigger warning for this, but I'm going to give a trigger warning. But I also have another example from a pickup artistry sales letter. I'm going to self bleep. But if you are sensitive, if you are a little, if you're a little sensitive child, a little, a little tender underbelly, maybe come back in like 10 minutes. All right. All right. It's important to illustrate a point that I sort of alluded to just a moment ago. This is an example from Pickup Artistry Copy. The sales letter, I believe it was for an offer called Pandora's Box. I'm going to read this intro. I'm very sorry. It is extremely misogynistic. I do not like it, but we can learn a lot from misogynists. Hi, I'm Ben, and this is my magic magnet. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you how this weird little magnet pulls harems of horny women straight 
to my D. Oh, and this magic magnet attracts even the hottest woman. I'm pulling perfect tens, usually reserved for the rock stars and celebrities like a tractor beam cranked up to full power. Yet this still, this strange magnet works like gangbusters on normal girls too. In fact, I could point it at your typical girl next door and she wouldn't even stand a chance. I simply pointed at her, pointed at my C word and her P word slides right on. I used it on my ex-girlfriend who hated me. Then I effed her. I used it on my best friend, Laura, who was <laughs> in love with her fiance. I effed her too. I even used it on some B who had the nerve to tell me she he was out of my league, so I effed her in the A. God, just every organ in my body is just feeling gross. That's how this opens. That's how that sales letter, that webinar opens. Kind of like how I opened this particular discussion with the whole cred section that is more aligned with viewers of copywriting YouTube videos. This opens with something that a lot of young men desire the ability to draw harems of horny women. <laughs> I, can't laugh. I can't say it without laugh. It's ridiculous. Just look at what happens later on in this particular webinar. This is from somebody else who quote unquote used the system. Let me just tell you, I've never known that a, feel a woman's feelings can change so fast when you know what buttons to push. She started talking about marriage and how we're meant to be together and must have been together in a past life. I've never experienced anything like this. My whole life has become surreal. No joke. I even pinched myself to see if I would wake up. In fact, because it is so difficult for me to accept, she constantly reassures me by telling me how much she loves me, can't live without me, and would never leave me. So long story short, we're getting married next year, and you're invited. Look at the difference in... This is the same sales letter. Same sales letter, but look at the difference in tone there. You have to open with this to get all the, you know, insecure, immature men who think that they want just casual sexual encounters to be desired by harems of horny women. But you go deeper into that sales letter and what you realize from all the examples and what the real promise, what the real benefit of this particular pickup artistry product is, is to teach people how to love and to be loved, to teach people how to find relationships they can feel secure in. Oftentimes, pickup artistry sales letters appeal best to people who either have had a lot of difficulty with women or who have gone through really bad breakups. And what you find with those particular demographics is that they're deeply, deeply insecure and also really, really afraid to be vulnerable. These people have a natural distrust of the opposite sex because they feel that they've been spurned from so, for so long. But look at the implied benefit there. In fact, you know, she constantly reassures me by telling me how much she loves me and that she can't live without me and would never leave me. Nobody says that if they're not afraid of being left alone. Pick up artistry sales copy leans very heavily into people's deep insecurities about being unlovable. You have to understand that like you often can't just open up and you know really get right at the heart of like people's deepest vulnerabilities. Oftentimes you have to talk about those surface level superficial benefits first, before you can get into deeper benefits. Those are things that you kind of want to keep in mind. And th this is applicable whether you're writing pickup artistry copy or not. I would personally prefer you don't write pickup artistry copy, but you do you. Now, I want to give you one final example. This is an example from my own copy. Uh, this is from a financial sales letter. The uh, whole idea behind it was that um, they had finally found a cure for sickle cell anemia and other like genetic diseases were on the way. And I found a poster presentation that was not supposed to be released yet, but had accidentally been posted to a site that basically showed the preliminary data for a CRISPR therapy that rewired and remapped somebody's genes so that they didn't have sickle cell anemia anymore. So the whole premise was around like how debilitating genetic diseases were suddenly like these incurable things were now suddenly being cured. And then 
I attach that idea to like, well, when biotech companies actually do successfully cure things, they at least the big gains. And I showed specific examples of stocks that had gone to the moon in a while, uh, things that had like produced a lot of you know income for people. So that was the previous section, the actual examples of stocks that had gone up as a result of crazy biotech breakthroughs. Now I'm going to read you my own copy. This is this is for real something I wrote for one of my sales letters. And today you can see how to be an early investor. By the way, I have to, when you write financial copy, you have to write things like today, you can see how to be an early investor. You can't write today. You can become an early investor because you're selling the information, the research and not the actual stock. And you have to word things in a way that clearly spells out that difference. All right. Imagine if you were an early investor in Regeneron, Biogen or Amgen. How do you think you'd feel today? What do you think it's like? to live every single day of your life without having to ever worry about money. A life without the weight or worry of financial pressure. A life without ever having to say to yourself, no, I can't afford that. Every morning, your coffee tastes a little bit better because you're a multimillionaire. Every afternoon, your hobbies feel a little bit more fulfilling because you're a multimillionaire. Every evening, you find it easier to fall into a restful, deep sleep because you are a multimillionaire. And best of all, one day you might meet a nice young man who tells you a story that he was born with a horrible disease and it was completely cured by the company making the announcement on Monday, the company I'm teasing and alluding to in this promotion. You'd be able to smile knowing that you played a small role in making the world a better healthier place. I just showed you that this life is not a pipe dream. It's entirely possible. This is simply what happens when folks make millions by investing in companies announcing real medical breakthroughs. I am going to pat myself on the back. That copy is pretty good. It's it's a hair better than good. So what, what do we have here? We have different benefits of being a multimillionaire. And like, I'm having fun with that. I'm going a little crazy. Then I go deeper and I talk about what we're really talking about here. We're not talking about you making money. We're also talking about you helping the world become a better place. We're talking about you having an impact on individual people's lives because of the investment decisions that you're making. That is the power of a deeper benefit. Because here's the thing that you have to understand about financial newsletter buyers and people who respond to financial offers. Yes, you can make a lot of money by appealing to greed. For example, I showed you the pickup art artistry copy. There's plenty of copy out there in the world for pickup artists that only focuses on what's up here, the outcome that I'm not going to say because I'm worried about getting this demonetized. For financial buyers, it's very similar. You can sell a financial product by promising people a lot of money. Here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize about themselves or about financial buyers, which is very simply that there's a lot of guilt around making a lot of money, a lot of guilt. People who make money feel like they are selfish and nobody wants to feel selfish. Even selfish people don't want to feel selfish. What I did with that in my mind was connect those benefits to the deeper benefit. Slavoj Žižek, the philosopher, talks a little bit about this when he talks about Starbucks coffee, which is, hey, yes, Starbucks, it's a little bit more expensive, but we get our coffee from local farmers. Part of the extra cost of Starbucks, then, you go in your mind. Again, these are the, the implicit deeper benefits of Starbucks. Uh, th these are the desires and notions that you have about the world. The little extra money that you spend on Starbucks, well, that helps you allay your concerns about consumerism, about exploiting other people. Starbucks helps you overcome those objections that you have. Just as my copy here is helping people overcome that objection that they have, well, if I, what if I'm just making a lot of money, but I'm not helping the actual world? People actually do feel that in their heart of hearts. And so that's why I wrote that. So these are things that you want to think about when you're going from benefits to deeper benefits. So I want to give you just a, f a few simple tools to help you go a little bit deeper. First and foremost, if you're looking at features and you want to spell out features, you want to know what features to include, you want to ask yourself what about the product and you want to ask yourself what matters. Personal computers, again, it might make sense for you in an ad to talk about the capability of a processor, the actual CPU. How many gigahertz does it have? How many threads does it have? You know, what type is it? That All that stuff is what matters to people. Here's a feature that probably doesn't matter to people. The ability to activate and enable vectorization compiling in your CPU. That's a feature. None of you know what the f 
fuck that means. A very, very, very tiny demographic of people actually care about vectorization compiling. So you probably don't want to mention that in your copy. Like, for example, if there's a sp specific spring type in a pen, unless there's a specific benefit to that, it doesn't matter. Now, there are occasions where a weird feature can actually help a piece of copy stand out. There's a famous ad, what was it? Oh, wheat fired from guns. And it was like the, the, the popped grain, uh, wheat puffs. And the whole thing mentioned that it was like wheat fired from cannons of peace. And all the copywriter did was like, look at how this thing was being made. And all puffed wheat was being made the same way, but he was the only copywriter to actually mention that feature. All about positioning. Like, what do you show first? Like, gun, like wheat fired from guns of peace? What the fuck? That's the kind of reaction you want to get from like a lead or from a headline. It's toasted. Uh, is another example of tobacco and how that was sold. Advantages. You want to ask yourself what's different. So for example, if one company is selling a 70 inch monitor and you're selling a 72 inch monitor, might be worth mentioning. Other brands are missing some inches. <laughs> but one of the things that I like about advantages, and I really didn't talk about advantages very much because like most of you kind of understand intuitively what advantages are, but you can have advantages that are features and you can have advantages that are benefits. I'll give you a specific example. If something helps cure your foot warts, that's a benefit. And if you want to know like why a person would want to cure their foot warts, oh, it allows them to go walking with their grandchildren again. Oh, that's a deeper benefit. What would be an advantage? It cures your foot warts faster than other brands. It has a higher likelihood of success than other brands. Those are both advantages in terms of benefits. What would be an advantage in terms of features for this foot wart cream? Well, the tube is bigger, so you get more for your money. That's what you're looking at there. You're looking at what is different and how you can spin that into something that has either a direct or implied benefit. Benefits, that's what we've been talking about mostly for the past 30 minutes, which is why should somebody care? Nobody is going to buy something if it does not touch on the reasons why people buy. Obviously, there are certainly some freaks out there who buy for the sake of buying. But for the most part, people buy either because they desire something or they desire to be rid of something. And if you go back earlier into the stream, you'll see a full list of the reasons why people buy. A really, really easy way to spell out benefits in your copy is to just go through that list and articulate some of the features as being capable of delivering the results in that list. Let's say you have a feature and I don't know, the it's a masterclass on how to make friends and influence people. Let's say it's a book, a 200 word book and the, the actual book itself, large print font, so that it's easy to read, et cetera, et cetera. Those are features. But why do people buy it? Why do people buy how to win friends and influence people? To be liked, to make money. Those are the reasons, the benefits that you're trying to get at. And you can just go down this list and just look at different features and be like, okay, how does this feature allow for this outcome? These are all the outcomes that you really need to pay attention to. And if you do that, you're probably gonna come up with some really good benefits. Deeper benefits are a little bit harder. That you actually have to rethink very deeply about people's psychology and like, what spurs them to do things. And then deeper benefits, you can get at them by just asking yourself, but what does that really mean or why? The thing that you wanna keep in mind is when you're looking at a benefit, oftentimes that outcome, if it's not good enough, can probably be made better by simply asking, but what does that really mean, a benefit? This will allow you to be liked. But what does that really mean? It's going to allow you to say things like, uh, or you know, experience things a little bit more in the world because you'll have more people around you that you can experience those things with. And so the deeper benefit is like having a richer experience of life. But what does that really mean? Like, why do you want that? Well, you know, perhaps you're afraid of missing out and getting to the end of your life and feeling like you wasted your life. But what does that really mean? Well, it probably comes from like, you know, watching your father like drink himself to death because he was an alcoholic and he was addicted to Percocet. And so he ended up dying before he ever got the one thing that he always said he truly wanted, which was to get to meet his grandchildren. Oof, 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 ow. When you start writing things, like as you're doing these exercises and you're coming up with stuff that makes you go like, oh, God damn. That's when you know you're onto something. Now, here's the thing. Talk about that PUA copy again. I do secretly love that copy because I think it really illustrates what I was trying to say earlier, which is that you know, two things. One, the thing that really, really sells a product is how it taps into those deeper desires. And the other thing it does really well is it really smoothly, 
like without any friction segues into those deeper desires by attracting people initially with what they think they want. How do we know we are going in the right direction with this? As you do this more, you'll see what I was talking about earlier, which is very simply that not every product needs all four. Not every product needs features, advantages, benefits, or deeper benefits. They just don't. Butt scratchers, for example. Does it scratch your butt? That's what people want. Now, there might be identifications that people have. Like, for example, if you find that most people who buy butt scratchers are also environmentalists, you might mention that it was like, oh, made from purely recyclable bamboo. Okay, that's a feature that's worth mentioning because you understand whom you're speaking to. And once you sort of start to piece together all these things and start to build a little, like a few constellations of like, okay, these are the types of people that buy. These are the different desired selves that they have. These are the different pathways that they want to take to get there. And like, these are the sort of like, you know, benefits, advantages, features, deeper benefits that would allure and entice them pretty well because they themselves are sort of revealing that to you. You start to develop an intuitive sense. You know, Michael Palmer calls it the golden gut. Like at a certain point, you just have to try so many different things and write so many different things and encounter so many different ads that you just develop that intuitive sense. And I'm sure you experience like as I was going through and asking myself, you know, about these deeper benefits and trying to get there, we arrived at some really, really like deep yearnings and deep, powerful emotions that people have simply by interrogating ourselves. As long as you're doing that, as long as you're trying to go a little bit deeper, trying to look at things through a lens that most people don't think, I often describe this as lateral thinking, like you want to move a little bit to the side of what people normally do. That's when you're going in the right direction. Before we go any further, and before I pull out a spreadsheet that's basically blank at this point, what questions do you guys have for me? Not only does it boil down to empathy, but it also boils down to like your ability to be empathetic with people whom you do not feel any empathy for. Because one of the things that you will realize as you progress in your copywriting career is that most people, the vast majority of people, they just do not want what you want. They do not believe what you believe, and they do not identify as you identify. And so a lot of what you need to do is really try to understand as best as you can what people are going through, what people have gone through, so that you can tap into what they desire and yearn for more. How do you know you're hitting on the best deeper benefit? Is it ever safer to just stick to benefits and hit a wider audience? Yeah, and that's what I was meaning too, which is, to say that not every product needs a deeper benefit. Not every product even needs advantages. You can make a whole career just talking about features and benefits. That's fine. It really comes down to if you think you can articulate somebody's deep yearning. And oftentimes that comes from, again, doing interpersonal research. Like for example, with the hearing aid example that I gave, Dan Kennedy interviewed a lot of people and what he found was some of the common threads. Fear of being perceived as demented, untrustworthy, etc. It's all about their perception. And he sort of like pieced it all together and figured out the why. And that's your job. And once you start to see those deeper yearnings being repeated in your market research and your customer research, that's when you know you're onto something. And that's when it's really important to actually articulate it. Now it goes back to personality and psychology, but more generalized for the specific customer group. Absolutely. And I, I gave the example of the iron neck earlier because I wanted to show you guys that like when you start analyzing stuff from this lens, you're going to be tempted to be like, oh, this is my only demographic and this is the only way that I can sell to people. No, there are some products that have multiple demographics and each of those demographics have their own desires, their own notions, their own identifications, their own characteristics. And because of those differences in those markets, you will have to find different features to highlight, different benefits to highlight, different advantages to highlight, different deeper benefits to highlight. When can you stop yourself from jumping to conclusions when trying to figure out the deeper benefits? Feel like our assumptions are about others can often skew the conclusion we make. Go back to what I said earlier about like making sure that what you're coming up with aligns with some inference you're making about people based on what they give you. Don't just make shit up about people. And all the examples that I've given so far in this presentation, not a lot of it feels very far-fetched. Some of it did, and I said, okay, we need to re rein it back in. And that's what you want to do. At the end of the day, what features to feature, what advantages or benefits to feature, that's an assumption too. 
a lot of copy is kind of a choose your own adventure novel, putting stuff out there into the world, seeing if it works. And if it doesn't work, trying something else. At the end of the day, you, you ask this question, how can you stop yourself? Oftentimes you can't. Oftentimes you don't know how. You just have to come up with the best things that you can and test it. I was talking to a, uh, a copywriter who has made not generated revenue, but actually made $40 million from writing copy. I drive a, a Lamborghini, ironically, and you know, hang out with supermodels like for video shoots and stuff like that because it's f funny, because I like making fun of that. He does it sincerely. <laughs> he actually drives a Lamborghini, and he certainly has the money to do it. I was talking to him, and I was talking about like what led to his success. And he was writing copy, and he hooked up with and became the sort of copy chief for a particular, you know, health, wellness, you know, mental coaching app slash platform. How many VSLs do you think this guy wrote before he had one that actually made him all most of his money? Thirty-four. He wrote thirty-four VSLs, thirty-four tests before the blockbuster. And remember, each VSL is, you know, the research, the script. The revision, the back and forth with a copy chief or entrepreneur, the editing, the production, 34. And so if you want those extreme results, you have to go or be, be willing to go to extremes. So these are things that you want to keep in mind. Part of your job as a copywriter, if you really want those outsized results, is to get deeper into the features, advantages, benefits, and deeper benefits a little bit better, a little bit more extremely than other people. But at the end of the day, this is all a numbers game. You're going to have more failures than you're going to have successes. Just ask the $40 million copywriter. His name is Peter Kell, by the way. He has a YouTube channel. It's pretty good. If you ever feel tapping into yearnings of folks you don't naturally feel empathy for is inauthentic, does it ever feel disingenuous? Um, it might to you, but what I've found is that when you pander to people's yearnings, they'll like you no matter what. You know, I actually, I knew a financial copywriter and he was very successful and very rich and very good. And he wrote some of the scummiest conservative pandering copy in the world. What he would do is take the money that he made from copywriting and then donate it all to Democratic candidates. <laughs> Because he was a staunch liberal. He would say things like, my goal in life is to take money from conservatives and give it to liberals. He was inauthentic through and through, disingenuous through and through. No moral compunctions or, or anything about that. He, he just did it. That was what he wanted in life. And you know what? His copy worked really, really well, even though he felt zero empathy for the people that he was writing to. This career is a choose your own adventure novel. Do you do your own market research by going through online forums and conversations? Yes. Um, I'll I'll look at Reddit, I'll look at things. But my favorite way to do research is really to just call people in the demographic that I'm speaking to. Like, just talk to them. You know, I, a lot of surveys too. I, I've written and sent out a lot of surveys. And that's a really good way to get at what people desire. And like, oftentimes when you send out a survey or do an interview with somebody that like is in your demographic, you just do it for inscription. And oftentimes what I've done is just like copy paste the survey or copy paste the transcription, put it into the copy, and then blammo, I barely edit it. And I just give people or show people what they want, like the, the thing that they're saying. And it works. It works really, really well. How to develop the deep benefit reasons faster. There's no shortcutting this. It's just hard. You know, it, it's, it's just a difficult thing. And I'm never going to say that it's a fast process because the moment you start taking shortcuts is the moment you start messing up really bad. We're going to practice. This is something, this is a practicable skill. You know, earlier I mentioned that like how I knew you guys, like how I knew the, the typical copywriter consumer of YouTube information. One of the notions that I said was that uh, copywriting is a knowledge-based skill and it isn't. It's a practice-based skill. Really it just comes down to like trying to come up with a product, listing out the features, and then trying to come up with different benefits. Sometimes that's off the top of the dome. Sometimes it's through research. When articulating deeper benefits, dimensionalization is going to play a big Big role. Sort of. Here's what I will do for you. If you are a member of the Copy That Patreon and you go to our newsletter tab, we were doing a free newsletter. We did 12 issues of it, but I have a whole 14 page report. What dimensionalization is, how to do it, how to do it really good. This is this is available to all patrons. Now, here's the thing. Uh, dimensionalization, you know, what is dimensionalization? All dimensionalization is 
is the articulation of a claim and then the recasting of that claim to give it more dimension and more meaning. And that could mean a lot of different things. You can dimensionalize features into benefits. You can dimensionalize benefits into uh, deeper benefits. You can also dimensionalize features or benefits into advantages. But really all we're talking about when we talk about dimensionalization is basically coming up with like, okay, so this feature is that it will help you scrub the stuff out of it from in between your teeth. There, that's the benefit. You know, let's dimensionalize that. So emotionally, imagine how happy you'll feel with like you know, nothing bothering your tongue in your mouth. Okay, that's one way to do that. You can go crazy with it. There's a dimension of history that you can add to these particular things, which is like, okay, you know, some of the most successful people in history have had, you know, clean mouths, all their teeth, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's a dimension that you can add as well. You said to stick for candles, one should stick to benefits, but for financial, we need to go deeper uh because one is cheap while the other is expensive no there are cheap financial newsletters out there you can buy a candle for 49 bucks and you can buy a financial newsletter for 49 bucks the difference between the two is that candles are a thing that people want there are people who simply enjoy having candles around there is not a person that i can think of on the planet who you know sweaty naked in bed rips the sheets off and goes oh my god i need a financial newsletter today so the reason why you need to go deeper with a financial newsletter is because, again, the nascent desire is not there. People want candles, you know, just like Lamborghinis. People just want it because it's a, it's a symbol of prestige and power. What did I just do there? I just got at a deeper benefit, or at least started talking about benefits and deeper benefits. Prestige and power, if that's the benefit, if that's what a Lamborghini confers to you, well, what's the deeper benefit of that? Oh, well, prestige and power, what can you get? Obviously, a, a coterie of supermodels to film a very silly video that's going to be on DIY wealth at some point in the future. That's what we're getting at here. Like some products people just want. And if it's Lamborghinis, you don't need a whole lot of copy to convince somebody to buy a Lamborghini unless you're trying to sell against alternatives. Like, for example, if you are a salesman and you're writing copy for Lamborghinis, but you know that you're writing to people that like are trying to decide between Lamborghini and Ferrari, then you might want to get into like benefits and deeper benefits. But with a candle, you don't need to talk about how like this candle is going to bring you closer to nature and that your being closer to nature is going to get you more in touch with who you really are in this like horrific consumerized world. You don't need to go there. People just want candles. Let's actually do something. And I want to do this like I did last time, where I very specifically ask you guys, okay, what's a product? Give me a product. And then we're going to do some cursory research and we're going to begin to try to turn features into benefits, benefits into advantages, and then all that into deeper benefits. Engagement rings. Okay. Ooh, a promise ring. Oh, Ryan. Nicely done. I like this because it's unusual. It's sort of niche. Not a lot of people know it. So promise rings are sort of like engagement rings, but it basically for like a bow, like, you know, somebody that, or not a bow, but like a, like somebody that you're going steady with. <laughs> Dorkiest thing I've ever said. But basically, they're just an outward symbol of commitment or fidelity to another person. They are not necessarily a promise of engagement, though. If you're really rich... You basically buy an engagement ring before the engagement ring. <laughs> okay, product details. Stone, cubic zirconia. Let's actually start gathering some stuff. So double heart, sparkling ring. Two heart nestled together at different angles to symbolize the love between a mother and child. <laughs> we found the wrong promise ring, guys. <laughs> we f***ed up. No, uh, we're just going to pretend that this was not said. Ring shank is accented with a half row of pave and asymmetrically attached to the two hearts for a more modern look. That's a feature. Here's the thing. The more modern look is the benefit. So what are the benefits of some of this? What's the benefit of cubic zirconia? Cheaper. Cubic zirconia, it's not a diamond. What do we know about diamonds? They're mined often by children and the conditions are horrific. So they're cruelty free. Advantages. Twice as many hearts. Ah, clear sparkle. That means it's eye-catching. It's elegant. Stylish. Absolutely. What are some of the advantages of this? You know, so we can look at the feature. Cubic zirconia. It's cheaper. That that basically counts as, you know, it's a benefit and it's an advantage over others. And now here's the thing. In your copy, for it to be an advantage, you want to say, like, what it's an advantage over. 
the benefit that you know this is cheaper than a diamond, it kind of counts as both a benefit and an advantage. So I'd put this in both camps. But if you want to go with advantages, you know, cheaper than other promise rings with diamonds. It depends. So it, it all depends on how you articulate it in the copy. So for example, if you say that because this is a cubic zirconia, and you say that, well, this allows you to have the elegance of a good looking ring, promise ring, without the problems that come along with a diamond, well, that's a benefit. Now, if you say, unlike other, you know, rings, brands, does not use um, unethically sourced diamonds. Now we're really, we're really emphasizing the advantage here. Another benefit that I want to sort of point out here is that if you look at this, you know, look at that design. It's pretty unique. It stands out. Can it be custom made? I don't know. Let's look. You can select the different size and you can also select gold plated. So those are both features. Okay, let's go at with deeper benefits. Let's actually start listing a few of these. Let's start thinking. Let's put on our, our empathy hats and our thinking caps and actually like try to go a little bit deeper into why people want this. If you're selling to men, a promise ring to men, girlfriend won't leave you because of prior commitment, possibly, to look richer, to look more wealthy, to increase your confidence. These will all fall under standard benefits. Why does somebody desire to look richer with a ring? Ooh, now we're on to something. A deeper, more meaningful bond with a person you love. Security. Knowing someone has promised to you. To brag? Okay, absolutely. Fits in with status? It pleases the significant other's family. I like where you're going with that. So here's the thing. It, it really depends. So it depends on whom you're trying to sell to. A lot of promise rings, if you're trying to sell it to a man, like you can have like status bragging rights around the size of the stone. You can have security knowing that someone has promised to you. But also there can be benefits for the woman as well. Let's actually look at this and try to come up with some copy. This is a good question. When a product is meant as a gift, it really should target ideally the gift buyer. But here's the thing. For some products, it often doesn't matter. And what you'll find for a product like jewelry is that women tend to tell, uh, I'm sorry I'm being so gender stereotypical, but women tend to tell men what they want. And then the men buy it if they're paying attention. Now, that means that the copy that originally sold the ring actually sold it to the woman who didn't buy it. The same goes on the flip side, too, where it's like a lot of gifts for men. The copy is for the man. The man is just like, I wanted this thing. And then the woman's like, I'm going to get that for that person. If we're going to come up with an angle, if we're going to come up with positioning for this, what do we want to do? Where, where do we want to start? I think we would probably want to start with eye-catching, elegant design. I would probably want to start there, go here second, 220 hearts. And then once you spell out that copy, then what I would probably do is a little bit after that, talk about the confidence and the bond right there. So that would be my positioning for this. You do that in one sentence, you know, the with an eye-catching elegant design of two intertwining hearts, it shows the deeper, more meaningful bond that you've established with your spouse. Imagine all the comfort and security that you feel with the person who loves you. It's time to make that last forever. Something along those lines. You know, I looked at this list and I said, okay, what is the best way to enter in? The best thing to position in? You know, you think about that as a benefit, like that's more going to appeal to people, like to reassure them that it's a good purchase, which means you don't want to start there. You want it to be elegant and eye-catching. And what's the benefit of that? Not only does it create the deeper bond, you know, what a promise ring is for, but also inspires more confidence. It also confers more status. Yeah, let's do a couple of lines for, of copy for this. I really don't want to, but I want to make you guys happy because I love you. So really just opening up with some benefits that I think would be appealing with an eye-catching and uh, elegant twin heart design. It's hand-finished. Our hand-finished double heart sparkling ring does more than verb the eternal loving bond and commitment you have. 
So what did I do here? I looked at some benefits. I led with some benefits and then worked a feature in there. And then I was like, okay, we need to introduce what this actually is. Just have a call out of what the thing is. Again, it's product description copy, so it doesn't need to be like super buried. Our hand finished double heart sparkling ring. Okay, that's what it is. Does more than symbolize the eternal loving bond and commitment you have. I wove in some deeper benefits, but also said that there's more to it than this, which invites and pulls the reader in more. Oh, there's intrigue here now. Won't we leave with bond commitment? Rewind back to that the magic magnet copy that I read earlier. <laughs> you don't want to leave with deeper benefits. You want to you want to segue in. You want to have this be the like a, a flower that blooms. Why did I say that? <laughs> Ridiculous. Ryan, you are on fire today. Capture is a good one. Capture the eternal loving bond and commitment you have. We need another sentence. So what does it do more than that? So let's go back to our list. Let's see, what would be the next details that we want? The stylish design. We're gonna get real into the weeds really quick. The stylish and comfortable design. If you ever feel like you're doing like this and this and this and this and this and this too much, use a rhetorical device called asyndeton. What is asyndeton? Asyndeton. Asyndeton very simply means omitting a coordinating conjunction. What are your coordinating conjunctions? Fanboys, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Asyndeton simply means omitting one of these and replacing it with a comma where it would normally go. So you have the stylish, comfortable design as opposed to the stylish and comfortable design. It's simply a way to make your copy sound a little bit better without being like this and this and this and this and this but this and this or this. That's what asyndeton is for. Lens the wearer air of confidence, secure, they are secure and loved. Yeah, it's totally fine to put hard twice close together. A secure and loved in a unified bond. Ooh, look at that. But there you go. That's That's two sentences, 47 words, of product description copy. And like towards the end, that's when you would start to, you know, look at the features and the benefits that are like more about appeasing or overcoming objections. All I did was like, I looked at the benefits and then sort of like wove features into that and then tied it all together. I went through the list, eye catching and elegant with an eye catching and elegant twin heart design. Benefit, benefit, feature, hand finished, feature, does more than capture. These are phrasal templates that you want to sort of like have in your head, which is like this thing does more than this thing. It does the this thing and then just play mad libs a little bit and your copy is going to be better for it the eternal loving bond and commitment you have ooh deeper benefit but look at that we had to get through two benefits and two features before we got to the first deeper benefit the stylish benefit comfortable benefit design lends the wearer an air of confidence deeper benefit knowing that they are secure and loved in a unified bond there you go the magic show must get bigger Absolutely. How long should a product description be? It should be exactly as long as a skirt. Long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to keep it interesting. All I did was just list out the benefits, you know, list out the features, and list out the deeper benefits. There you go. What consumable product should we do? Ooh, dark chocolate. And I want to find something that's a little like off the beaten path. Rocka chocolate. All right. Let's do something a little weird, guys. Let's do... uh. Guess what those chocolate bars? Bourbon cascaged chocolate bar. The tuxedoed sophisticate. So if you're rewriting people's pages and stuff like that, one of the things that I did was show you, like you can really pull a lot of the benefits and features from their page already, and then just do a little extra thinking. Single origin, it's Tanzanian cacao. Ooh, that's, a, that's, that's unique. I like that. Aged in bourbon casts for two months. Deeply nuanced bar, cocktail-like vibe, oaky and smooth taste, with a hint of cherry cordial and finish. Now, one of the things about this that I want to sort of illustrate for you guys is that the description, unlike the previous one, where you know we had a mix of like features and benefits and deeper benefits, this is basically pure features, and it's still really good. I'm gonna be honest, guys, this be good copy. It's short, it's simple but it's good. It does what it needs to do. It's the best-selling bar. And that's one of the things that I uh, was kind of alluding to earlier, which is like, you know, some products, some situations don't lend themselves to going deep into benefits or going deep into deeper benefits. People want chocolate. <laughs> you know, just the same way people want computers, people want chocolate. People want chocolate more than they want computers. And so you really don't need to like 
connect this to people's deeper desire for like love and commitment and security. I, I think that that's just a, a brand thing, a brand voice thing. Here, let's let's actually like look at some of the other examples. Candy cane white chocolate, sheer winter cheer. Yeah, it's just a brand thing. So like these are these are sort of like like fun little brandy taglines. At a certain point, like if we start really going into like the benefits and the features, uh, like the benefits beyond the features of this, you might actually sell people against it because then it will feel like you're just trying too hard and it will feel disingenuous. So like the subscription box, you know, maybe you want to actually like go into benefits, but let's see if they actually do. You know, like what what are the benefits of, you know, single origin? Know where you're getting your food, Tanzania cacao. You could say something like, you know, uh, there's no exploitation involved in the actual harvesting of the cacao. Unroasted, you know, gives it a fuller flavor. Things like that. Let's actually like look at the subscription boxes and see if they would do that. Because I, I, I feel like this is a good illustration of like, you know, earlier before I was saying like, it, you have to develop your gut and sort of like get an intuitive sense of like when you would want to go deeper and when not to. And this is all stuff where it's a good example of when not to, except for their boxes. 30 of our bean to bite size mini bars. Okay. In one pantry ready package. What, what's the subtext of pantry ready? It's convenient, easy to store, and that's a benefit. Perfect for those who just need a daily nibble or more. That's a benefit. We offer six flavors in mini form. These are features. Pick your favorite and try our mixed box. Notice how once we went away from something that people just kind of intuitively want to something that people don't really automatically assume that they want, now we're leading with benefits. That's what's happening here. Subscribe and save $6. That's a benefit. Absolutely. And it's spelled out right there. Flavor and aroma means different things to different people. Who are we to tell you what flavor of chocolate aroma is for you? Celebrate individuality with our variety boxes. Yeah, those are all benefits. And also, like, that touches on different, deeper benefits, too. That desire for individuality. Absolutely. One, um, I actually owned part of a chocolate company at one point and was trying to help market it. And one of the things that we really leaned on was selling it the way that wine is sold, which is that different cacao beans and cacao nibs from different regions will have different flavors. Different varietals of cacao will have a different flavor profile. And so we were leaning heavily into that. Obviously, that's all stuff that you would want to like spell out in the features and benefits and the deeper benefits, which is, you know, what is the deeper benefit of that? I mean, you'll get a greater, more robust experience of the world. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. And I feel like this is a good illustration to like end on because it really shows like exactly when you want to whip out your benefits and when to keep them in your pants. One easy bundle. The easiness is a benefit. The marquee, this, this, and this, and the new, yet nostalgic that. So certified, and these are all features as well. So again, three bestsellers, that's a feature. One easy bundle, the ease being the benefit. This did it very well. 30 feature, bean to bite size mini bars features in one pantry ready package, implied benefit right there. Perfect for people who want this, direct benefit. We fold crushed candy canes for vegan to this and this. Built out holiday carols. That's fun. This is all feature driven. This is fun. The implied benefit here is that you'll eat it and feel joy. So that's an, another example of an applied benefit. Here, again, very feature driven. Here, very benefit driven. I want you guys to really pay attention to that difference there because this kind of shows you when you want to go deeper and when not to. It's the moment that you're starting to ask people for money, more commitment. It's a thing that people don't normally want. That's when you want to start whipping out the benefits a little bit more. Yeah, their copy is very, very good. I, I'm, I, I'm a fan of the copy that I've seen from this company. So you would want to try to find like another chocolate company that's maybe not as big as Raka and take what you've learned from them and apply it there. That, that's how you get copywriting gigs, guys. That's that's the whole point of studying and breaking down other people's copy so that you can actually like take what you've learned and bring it to the people who actually need good copy. Raka, they have good copy. They don't need your copy. So don't apply to them. Apply to other people that want to beat Raka. I really hope that over the course of the stream that you guys learned something, that you grew, that you sort of start thinking about copy in a different way and started to connect like, oh, we're not just writing words to sell things. We're actually like trying to tap into 
deeper desires and notions of identifications and the features benefits thing is just the way to do that. Guys, I just want to say I appreciate you. I really do enjoy doing these. Um, and I really hope that, you know, listen, like what I did earlier on, like using the appeals of stuff was also like a sort of like meta commentary on this business. I don't want copy that to be the kind of business I have to stoop to like appealing to people in that way all the time. Um, and so the fact that you guys like have come on board, that you guys like have stuck with us for a very long time, that you support us and watch our stuff, it really means a lot. It, like, because again, this is a hobby business for us and we really appreciate you and really hope that we can have a meaningful and positive impact on your life. All right, I'm going to go have dinner, hang out with my kids, hang out with my wife. And, uh, you know, hopefully she's not too mad at me for, you know, doing the model photo again. I don't think she's mad at me.